welcome to another CAD Dimensions Lunch and Learn. If you've never attended our Lunch and Learn sessions in the past, we like to pick a topic that's important to our customer base and, and cover some elements of that topic, both in SOLIDWORKS and just uh, philosophy and fundamentals of that particular topic. Today we have a, a special presentation. It's a joint effort. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our guest presenter here in a moment. Uh, a couple of housekeeping issues before we get started. Uh, if you have a question during the presentation, uh, we're going to save the answering of those questions to the end. So if you could just post those in the question section of the GoToWebinar window. Uh, not in the chat. We don't really look at the chat as we do this, but we will take time at the end of the presentation uh, to answer any questions we are able to. Uh, one other bit of news that we have here is we want to make sure we get a little bit of information from you about the audience that we're dealing with today. Our topic is making SOLIDWORKS and gd and work for you. So I want to just try to understand who's using gd and So we're going to use polls. If you've sat in on our Lunch and Learns, you know what these polls are all about. The first poll that I have that you can vote on, do you regularly deploy drawings with gd and today? So I'll give you a few seconds to vote here, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at the response. So we uh, all have an idea. I'll go ahead and close it, and I'll share the results. It looks like uh, you know, half to three quarters of you are, are using uh, gd and today. Now, if you said no to that first question, here's a question for you. Do, do you find the need to implement gd and within your organization? Okay, we'll give you a few seconds to vote. And this is all for the, the no folks. And of course, I have a question for the yes folks here in just a question. Second. So I'll go ahead and close this and share that. It looks like overwhelmingly uh, those who did say no do have some need. Uh, if you do use gd and the question is, are you taking advantage of some of the SOLIDWORKS tools like DIM Expert and MBD? Okay, we'll give you a few seconds to answer these questions. All right, and I'll share that. It looks like some of you are, some of you are not, and I appreciate you answering uh, the questions. We are lucky today to have a guest presenter. We have Luis Aguirre from Techies, uh, a company right in our backyard that specializes specializes in training on gd and and helping organizations like yourself implement and utilize gd and and understand it. So Luis is going to take us through uh, gd and uh, and then we're going to come back and uh, talk a little bit about SOLIDWORKS and gd and Luis, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to be presenting today. Uh, can we set up my screen here? Like I said, welcome, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, uh, I am with Techies. We're going to talk about GD&T today. Uh, we provide uh, technical coaching and training materials for manufacturing and industry. Many ask, what is GD&T? Well, geometric dimension and tolerance is a concise language really used on engineering documentation to provide one clear definition of mechanical parts. I know many of you have, had, have sat in on drawing reviews, and you end up with multiple definitions of what that design intent is. With gd and it's clear. So geometric dimension intolerance is recognized around the world as the only effective way to define part geometry. There's no other way of doing it. What is gd and Well, there's symbols, uh, there's rules, there's vocabulary, uh, mathematical definitions. Yes, there's math behind the symbology. It's a national standard, ASME Y14 5M 1994. And it's an international standard, ISO 1101. In other words, it's a series of standards that ISO uh, puts out, which is 
not quite equivalent to Y14-5 because they don't mean exactly the same thing, but they do utilize the 14 symbols. So I want to talk about how GDT fits current and future uh, technology. So as technology changes, what happens with GDT? Well, first, let's backtrack a little bit and let's look at the symbols. There's 14 symbols. The important thing to understand about GDT is, yes, we have 14 symbols, but they all have different uh, characteristics and different controls. There's form, profile, orientation, location, runout. Characteristics like straightness, flatness, circularity, and cylindricity, and the list goes on. I want to ensure that everybody understands one thing. GD&T is not difficult. What's difficult is the misapplication of GD&T. When we understand the form controls and characteristics, things get a lot easier. Now, SolidWorks does, SolidWorks does provide a tool to make adding GD&T uh, a lot easier and simple on your drawings, so you want to make sure to take advantage of these tools. A guy by the name of Bob Trevor said, you can't make what you can't measure because you don't know when you've got it made. What a great question. Many ask, well, what does that mean? Well, it means just what it says. Sometimes tolerances are too tight. Sometimes features are designed in such a fashion that they cannot be manufactured or even measured. It's estimated that over 80% of engineering documents generated in the United States are flat in some way. Well, that makes me feel really good when I hop on a plane or when I hop in my car. How good or how accurate is that vehicle going to run? Well, that's not really what we're saying. What we're really saying is that we're spending a lot more money to design parts. Your part does function. Airplanes do fly. It's just costing a lot more money. We have to ask ourselves, how many revisions does it take to get it right? I remember one engineer once told me, revisions are cheap. Well, I don't know how that company was running because everywhere I work, revisions were not cheap. The engineering document drives the entire process, not the other way around. Sometimes it seems like the process is driving the engineering document. Manufacturing is constantly calling design or engineering asking for changes because the tolerances didn't work. We have a drawing, and it's the common thread between design, production, and quality, and other folks that might be on that collaborative team, if you will. Everybody better understand what the drawing means. It is the common thread. It's also a legal document, and guess what? That drawing can appear in court if anything should go wrong. Many folks just don't understand how important it is to get this drawing right. The sad news today is that most companies pay the least attention to this drawing. They're so concerned about getting that first article out to get an idea of how it looks and feels, and they wait for the drawing, or they wait to, to complete the drawing at the very last stage of the process. There's this assumption that any fool knows what the drawing means. Well, that's a misconception. Here we look, we look at this graph and we see that the Japanese launch products a lot quicker than Western countries. So you can see that uh, we're taking maybe 20 months longer. So there's a the time and there's a the number of changes it takes to get something right. There's problems resulting from overly tight tolerances. There's unclear geometry and unpredictable designs, which will manifest the following. Request for engineering changes. I know we've all experienced that. There's scrap. There's rework. Use as is decisions. That's a fun one. I got a great deal on the screwdriver set. Two for one deal. I was so excited until I got home and realized that the drivers on one of the screwdrivers was mis, uh, uh, misinserted in the handle or not inserted correctly. So you can see this is not a very robust design. So looking at these robust designs of that same screwdriver, we can see at the very top there on the right, uh, we have a not very robust design. We could misassemble that uh, driver into the handle. 
a little more robust there in the middle where we have the drivers uh, on each end of, uh, of the shaft, if you will, and there at the bottom, it's a little more robust. Uh, the handle is now uh, more simple. Uh, and when, when I show this slide, many folks think, well, does that mean we want to make everything as simple as possible and rectangular? And no, that's not, not really what we're saying because that's not reality. But we get the idea. Applying critical and predictable tolerances where needed is the key. As tolerances uh, get smaller, the cost is going to get up, uh, get higher, if you will. It's going to cost a lot more. My experience with the medical device industry and other uh, industries is interesting because most believe that as parts get smaller or components get smaller, that we somehow have to tighten up the tolerances. Super tight, not reasonably tight. There's a difference. So we need to understand how much tolerance to apply to these parts. Uh, it's incredible when you begin to do tolerance stack analysis and you begin to realize that we did not take advantage of all the tolerance that was truly allowed, yes, on small components. So the best design in the world is worthless if no one can produce it. And I have a true story. I had an engineer come to me and he said, you know what, can you look at my drawing? Uh, need to make this part. We want to make sure that uh, moving forward we're not going to have any problems. So I did a tolerance stack analysis on this part and I'm going to share a very simple example. Picture a hole getting really close to the edge of a wall of a component. Well, I did a tolerance stack analysis and by the time I was done, the hole could actually protrude through the wall, in fact go all the way through the wall. In other words, that hole would just disappear out of the solid material. As I continued through the process of doing a tolerance stack analysis with respect to GD&T, we realized there was a lot of features that were just disappearing. And many folks understand, uh, don't understand sometimes why they receive parts with, fe with features that have actually just disappeared. Well, that's the reason. My computer froze a little bit. Hold on one second. There we go. So this high-tech uh, hype, if you will, uh, I remember years ago folks said, we're, we're getting rid of designers, we're getting rid of drafters. We, in fact, we don't need to dimension drawings anymore. We have solid models. We have manufacturing. Manufacturing can load up the CAD model. Therefore, parts should always function. Well, boy, that was a misunderstanding of what really happened. We still have tolerances. Parts still have to be analyzed for functionality and fit. We have uh, CAD systems. There's our CAD operator. And it provides a way to make bad drawings faster. It's common to operate with, with an accuracy of 24 significant digits, inches or millimeters. An analysis is usually performed using the perfect CAD model, so we can be misled. We have CAM, Computer Aided Manufacturing, and it uh, CAM without GDP provides a way to make scrap faster. Usually accurate within three to four significant digits, not 24, so there's already a huge gap between design, which is CAD, and the manufacturing with respect to CAM. We have a core measuring machine and it provides to make a way to make sure parts are good even if they don't work. I know from personal experience uh, we're having worked on a CMM and inspected part, inspecting parts in the CMM uh, that I can make that uh, printout look pretty good. In other words, no red numbers on the report. And that's the problem. Most folks will look at the report, they'll see a printout, and as long as there's no red numbers, the part is good. The problem is that if we don't understand how that part was set up on the coordinate measuring machine, did they really simulate the function of the part with respect to a datum reference frame or mating services? If they did not, did not at best, they're just doing a best fit routine. In other words, just kind of moving the part around until it fits within the tolerance zones. So this is usually accurate within uh, four 
uh, to five significant digits, not 24. Having worked at NASA, I don't know how many times we had problems, and uh, you always got this email that you didn't really want to see or a message saying that, hey, or even on the news, Houston, it doesn't fit. And all of a sudden, everybody's scrambling, trying to figure out what went wrong. Well, with plus or minus tolerances, it's going to be difficult to find out. Which ED and T you can actually target functional relationships of features with respect to their tolerances. So here's a brief history of engineering drawings. Prior to, prior to World War II, drawings did not use GD and T. Usually tolerances were impressed by a general title block tolerance note. There were some drawbacks to this approach. There was confusion over how to set up the part for measurement. One wanted tolerance accumulation. Tolerance in the points in space that may not be measured, such as the center of a radius, and wedge-shaped tolerance zones. The following drawings are going to illustrate the evolution of engineering drawings over the past 60 years. So we have to ask ourselves, at what stage are the drawings you're using? Well, I have to tell you, don't be alarmed. Almost every company I've worked at, in fact, every company I've worked at, had these type of drawings. So here we're looking, we're looking at this drawing, uh, no state unless otherwise specified, dimensions are in millimeters, linear tolerances are plus or minus 0 0.2, angular tolerances plus or minus 2 degrees. While looking at this drawing, we have a uh, dimension of 15 plus or minus point, uh, 0 0.3 uh, for the uh, thickness of that part. We've located the holes with plus or minus tolerances. In fact, if you continue to study this drawing, if you've had any manufacturing background, or even if you were to kind of picture, you can picture yourself making this part, you have everything you need to produce this part. I have all the dimensions needed in manufacturing. The question is, what is the result going to really look like? Well, here's an exaggerated example of those surfaces, if we were to magnify them. And so you can see that the red lines represent the tolerance zone that the part needs to fall within. Here, it's not really passing inspection. You can see that the, uh, there on the right-hand side, that corner of the part is sticking out of the red zone, if you will. But if I shift the part now, we could say hey, it passes. What you've just observed is what may be a best fit routine, because what if the design intent was this? The alignment of the bottom surface there was more critical than the alignment of the uh, horizontal or vertical uh, surface. And so we want to make sure that we always simulate design intent when inspecting parts. So in other words, this part would have been bad, but with best fit routines, we can make that part look good, which is something we should not be doing. You cannot really define design intent using plus or minus tolerance or traditional methods of dimensioning. With GDNT, now we get to define the design intent. Datum A, there at the right of the page, becomes our primary datum. It has a flatness of 0.1, so we're controlling the flatness of that feature. Datum B is the vertical surface there on the left, controlled with perpendicularity with respect to datum A. And datum C is the horizontal surface, uh, perpendicular within 0.1 with respect to datums A and B. The origin for all dimensions are going to come from the intersecting datums or the corner of the part now. And now we've confirmed the, uh, or actually defined and indicated the design intent on the drawing. Looking at that, uh, at a radius, for example, if we were to use a plus or minus dimensioning scheme on a drawing, with plus or minus tolerances, uh, there on the left, you can see that the 75 will get a plus or minus linear tolerance of plus or minus 0.2. The 50 would also get a plus or minus 0.2 tolerance. And the radius would also get a plus or minus 0.2 tolerance. And there on the, uh, I'm talking about the figure on the left, looking at the right, uh, you can see that now the tolerance zone is going to vary. In fact, we're going to get kind of a movable target for the radius because of the plus or minus tolerances. In fact, during inspection, I could begin to play with those tolerances because now I'm mixing up location tolerances with feature tolerances. In this case, we're trying to control the form of a radius with respect to the 75 and 50 dimension. One of the things we should not be doing is mixing up those tolerances. In other words, locating tolerances versus feature tolerances. 
with GD&T, we utilize basic dimensions. So now 75 and 50 are basic. The radius is also 50. I mean, 30, and it's also a basic dimension. And so what that means is that that is the actual size of the features or nominal values. And now the tolerance is based on the feature control frame. Uh, so the feature control frame has a profile of 0.4 with respect to datums A, primary, B, secondary, and C, tertiary. Of course, the datum features are going to be based, uh, are controlled with form controls also. But you can see that we've now targeted the feature with respect to the design intent, the machinist knows exactly how to set up this part with respect to the datums, and the tolerance zone is very clear. In fact, this truly does simulate the manufacturing method, if you will. Manufacturing is not going to plug in 75 plus or minus some value in his uh, CAM program. He's going to plug in the 75 basic. So looking at that drawing uh, with gd &T, it becomes very clear as to what we're going to look for. And we can, you know, just looking at this drawing based on where we started with the plus or minus tolerancing scheme, I stated with the plus or minus tolerancing scheme, I could make that part of it if I was a machinist. But at the end of the, the end result would be maybe not quite what I expected with respect to design intent. But here, now we can clearly see that datum A is the primary. We're going to see the part on datum A first. We're going to put it up against the datum B surface and then datum C. And that's the way the part's actually going to function. We're locating the two-hole pattern now uh, with respect to functional surfaces. And so this is key. We also have to get the opportunity to take advantage of what we call, what we call modifiers. So there you can see in the upper right-hand corner, we have a position of 0.3 at max, max material condition with that modifier. Something that's beginning to happen with the industry is uh, folks are taking advantage now of these geometric controls. Uh, here's the note now that it's changed. So let me back up for a second and show you what we started with. On this drawing we had in the lower uh, right-hand corner, unless otherwise specified dimensions are 0.4 millimeters uh, uh, and uh, linear tolerance is a plus or minus 0.2, so plus or minus 0.4, plus or minus 0.2. Uh, and so dimensions are in millimeters, uh, but we get the idea here. We have these plus or minus tolerances that we're used to seeing in a Tata block. What's happening now is we're beginning to see this profile. Unless otherwise, uh, in the, and the standard note, unless otherwise specified, dimensions are in millimeters, untolerant dimensions are basic, and we get a profile of 0.4. So now the dimensions have no tolerances. They're theoretically perfect, but every surface is going to be controlled with that 0.4 profile tolerance, which again is going to be more consistent with manufacturing. So with this approach, measurement origins are clear. Tolerance accumulation is minimized. Features of tolerance, not points in space. And to the tolerance zones are now uniform. So how does GDNT fit into the current te technology, uh, current and future technology? Well, again, we've already said that we can utilize this note now, which makes the CAD file basic. So we don't want to take this next step unless everybody downstream has a technology necessary to interrogate and utilize the CAD file. So this is with respect to the Y144 one standard, digital modeling practices standard, where we actually tie the dimensions or gd &T directly to the CAD file. In other words, parametrically, parametrically attached. We see our note there at the, in the lower right-hand uh, corner of the page, unless otherwise specified dimensions are in millimeters. We have a CAD file number and it's basic and a profile of 0.4 with respect to datum A primary, B secondary, and C tertiary. In the fall of 2003, the digital modeling standard was introduced. That's a standard I just mentioned. And these were all the companies that represented uh, the committee. So ASME Y1441 establishes the rules for embedding, uh, embedding of tolerances in the CAD model. It looks rather messy there when you look at this drawing. But just remember, I want you to just kind of imagine you have this 3D part 
And as we rotate the part, say, to surface datum C there, all you're going to be able to see are the dimensions that apply to that particular surface. So we can say that we're more or less using a 3D method of tolerancing, but applying this 2D method, if you will, with respect to a surface. So ASMA Y14-41 establishes the rules for creating drawings with 3D views rather than the conventional third angle or first angle ortho orthographic projection. The ASMA Y14-41 standard will enable reduced dimensional drawings. In other words, less dimensions on drawings only because the CAD file does become the drawing. And we can actually utilize a CAD file to derive the nominal values of features, for example. So solid work tools are for model-based definition. So I'm going to pass this on now and, and uh, let my friends at SolidWorks talk about this. Thanks, Luis. So in SolidWorks, we have tools for creating gd &T frames manually on drawings. But our discussion today not only is about the GD&T and its implementation, but also about the, the 3D PMI and how we interrelate the both. Now, one of the questions I asked at the beginning of our presentation was about the SOLIDWORKS tools that you may be taking advantage of. And I think most of you who said that you're, that you're implementing GD&T, you're using feature control frames on drawings using the standard tools. However, there's other tools that are, I would say, underutilized at this point. And the first of those is the DIM Expert. So the DIM Expert is for the 3D PMI, exactly what Luis was talking about, following the ASME standard of how we create dimensional information directly on a solid model, how we organize it, and how we create a document in which we can uh, utilize to share this information. Because again, we're talking about bypassing 2D drawings, maybe having less dimensions in a 3D model. So what is the DIM Expert? Well, it's a very, very smart tool that's going to help us to automate the process of creating gd &T. Now, it's so smart that it actually has over 100 gd &T rule checks built into it. So if you do something incorrectly, if you implement something that's in the standard that uh, that uh, wrong that is in the standard, it will tell you that you've done something wrong. Now, it goes off of machining features, not modeling features. So there's 14 pre-recognized machining features. I'm going to show you today a notch. But these are things that are, are a little different than what we're used to from modeling an existing part. The great part about the DIM Expert, although it's been there for many years, is it's integrated in many of the different facets of what we use SolidWorks for. First of all, it's integrated in drawings. If I create DIM Expert annotations, I can bring them into drawings. You'll see that in a second. It's integrated with Tall Analyst. You heard Louise mention tolerance stack ups. Well, we have a tool to do that as well. If you use DIM expert dimensions, we can do stack ups. And then for model based definition or 3D PMI, we use our MBD product. Well, all of this is built on the DIM expert. So let's take a look at how this tool works. Now, I have a very simple part in this case, and uh, I've turned on in our command manager model based definition. Model-based definition is a quick and easy way for us to get to some of the DIM expert tools. Um, in those tools are the ability to define things that we've been discussing today, like basic dimensions, size and location dimensions, uh, geometric uh, frames. In this case, as I'm starting to define those individual items, in this case, uh, a datum for a part, I can select the surface that I'm making that datum, and the software applies the 3D PD PMI directly to the model. On top of that, we have a tool for showing the tolerance status, essentially showing me whether or not I've defined individual surfaces completely. So I can continue to work this, for instance, maybe creating a size dimension 
on the outside of the model. Now, MVD and DIM expert dictates how the dimensions are going to look and how many we need in order to fully define the part. And it keeps track of it in a feature tree type way. Now, one of the things we mentioned on the slides is, is it's more automated. You don't have to sit here and manually add every dimension uh, to fully define this particular part. So what I'm going to do is go over to the DIM Expert tool right inside of SOLIDWORKS, right next to your Configuration Manager, and I'm going to create an auto dimension scheme. I tell it the type of part and the type of tolerancing I'm going to use, and I just define my datum structure, just as we were talking about with 2D drawings. The difference here is we're going off machining features. My tertiary datum is going to be this slot in the side. Watch as I select it. I have selection tools that recognize this is a slot. Now once I give it all this information and say, OK, the software is going to use the standard and the DIM expert tools to give you all the dimensions necessary to manufacture this. On top of that, all the control frames necessary. Now from here, it's our job to organize this data. So what I would potentially do is go to my various views in the part, organize the dimensions, place them where I would want them uh, for a drawing, uh, because we're going to be able to utilize this information downstream. Okay? A couple different views have uh, dimensional data associated with it. Now how do we get to the drawing end of things? Okay. Under uh, the file menu, I can make a drawing from the part. I pick my template. When I get to the drawing, my view palette has some options built into it. Import annotations, dim expert annotations. And all I have to do is drag those two views onto my drawing and look what I've just done. The position of all the control frames, dimensions, basic dimensions are all utilized from the views in the 3D model. So there's already some level of integration there. Let's go back to the model for a second and assume that we're not going to create one. What we have built into the model is a section for MBD called model views. What I can do here is find a view that I would typically capture on a drawing, such as this, and capture the 3D view. I can capture custom property information, all sorts of information about the model right in the 3D. The last part of this process is how we share that information with other people. We have a DIM expert scheme. We can utilize it on a drawing, or we can create it within the 3D model. In order to share it, I might create a 3D PDF. Here's an example of a 3D PDF of an assembly. What's great about utilizing GD&T on 3D PDFs is there's some intelligence built into utilizing the 3D model. First of all, in this case, I have a build material where I can make selections of components and I highlight. But if I go over to the uh, dimensions or tolerance frames, you'll notice that there's 3D highlighting. Now, this is the, the one problem with 2D drawings is you still got to create this picture in your mind of what it is you're really controlling. It was DIM Expert, GD&T, and 3D model views we can very clearly get a picture of that. So these are the tools that I was talking about with SOLIDWORKS. These are the tools that we can start take advantage of and make creating uh, GDT based models much, much faster. So I'm going to turn it over to Luis. He's going to finish talking about GDT and introduce you to techies and what kind of things they offer for you to learn GDT. There you go, Luis. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, so DIM Expert and MBD, you can completely detail the drawing, automatically dimension manufacturing features, graphically display dimensional status, display dimensions created in 3D automatically on the drawing, apply plus or minus or geometric uh, dimension and tolerances. We can display dimensions and tolerances in 3D based uh, in 3D based or on rules per ASME by 1441, 2003. Incredible advantages to DIM Expert. 
So again, here's just some drawings that came out of, right out of that standard, the Y14-4-1 standard, where we see the GD&T directly tied to the CAD model. So we want to relate design, manufacturing, and quality. So where do, we where do tolerances come from, many ask? Well, past practice or carryover, legacy parts, data found from in handbooks, uh, seat of the pants guesses, which is interesting, uh, individual experience of a designer, or maybe it's spec heaven. At the end of the day, we need to understand the process in order to apply the correct tolerances. May come from the voice of the customer. Or maybe there's design alternatives. And so you can see there's uh, all kinds of things that can occur here. So now I'm going to move on again. And so we want to select the appropriate dimension tolerance early in the design cycle, which is going to, it's going to result in a more robust design higher quality, shorter time to market, better product understanding, and fewer fit and functional problems, and also fewer engineering changes. We don't want to just throw drawings over the wall. That doesn't help the process. We want to define CP and CPK. So we have this drawing, and it is going to uh, drive the design, if you will. So we need to understand exactly what uh, we need to uh, assign with respect to tolerances on this part or on the drawing. Remember, the drawing is driving the process, not the other way around. There's a quality plan based on the drawing as well. We've talked about robust design and what that means. We want to be able to predict CP and CPK. We want to be able to understand product cycle life, uh, uh, product cycle time, early life failures, and so forth. Lack of robustness will hurt. So a major contributor to early life failures is poor CPKs. This usually results in a loss of market share or reputation. How many times have we seen that? Here's a quick drawing, an uh, uh, old drawing. You can see that uh, I gave this drawing to supply or to my manufacturer, I even drew a sketch and said, hey, this is the way I want the part to look. I want everything perfectly centered. But the end result was this. Without GD&T, this is what you get. Now I've updated the drawing with GD&T, and you can see I say what I mean on the drawing. I define design intent. So I'm locating features with respect to this design intent. At the end of the day, these features will move on us, right? We want to make sure under the machinist understands that these features are all going to move with respect to the way parts go together, not the way they're manufactured. So GDNT's role in concurrent manufacturing, who is positively impacted by GDNT? Well, design, production, and suppliers' quality in the entire enterprise. The drawbacks of not using GDNT will include confusion over how to set the part up for inspection. I demonstrated that earlier. There's going to be untolerance at tolerance accumulation. Tolerancing the points in space, uh, and the list just goes on. How design is helped? Well, we get clear design intent. We have a bracket and a module. We want to make sure that we relate the features to the assembly or how these features actually go together or mate. The drawing would indicate this. There's going to be fewer engineering changes. So that means cost-effective parts. Shorter cycle time for a concept to launch. Again, that's going to mean, remember, the first person who gets a product on the market means that they're going to be making the most money. So we create a cost-effective part, and we shorten the ability to really get the uh, part out the door. So I'm going to skip over to the next slide here, and uh, you'll just bear with me for just a second. So at Techies, we do provide GD&T uh, training. Our involvement with standards committees means you're going to uh, be aware of upcoming changes to national and international standards. You're going to have a voice at the standards meetings. You're going to have the most authoritative training possible. There's course offerings such as print reading, fundamentals of GD&T, applications of GD&T, tolerance stack-ups, and inspection. 
There's in-class presentations, there's computer-based training, and there's also public seminars. The highlights of the training, the emphasis on simultaneous engineering, uh, associate GD&T GD with CP and CPK, the gd &T hierarchy, uh, economical and practical approach, and uh, we tie the inspection and manufacturing into the gd &T as well. We want to link, link DFA and DFM, and we try to have some fun with this as well. So uh, we want to make gd &T fun. I just want to remind everybody that with DIM Expert, some points that I want you to understand is that it's a smart tool. It has built-in model intelligence. It does help with tolerance stacks. And remember, a tool is only as good as its user. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks, Luis. Uh, before we get to the questions here, I got just um, some final polls here. Um, just to close, and then we'll take some of the questions off the list. So uh, just a little bit, we want to find out if this information has been helpful to you folks. Uh, we're possibly looking to do some more of these in the future. Uh, maybe dig a little deeper to the SOLIDWORKS tools and the GDT rules and how to implement uh, that kind of stuff. So let me go ahead and close. It looks like overwhelmingly we did uh, a decent job today presenting the information. Uh, and then finally, uh, just uh, some of the things that we can follow up with and uh, have some conversations about. Um, you can, this is multiple choice. If you want to know a little bit more about any of these particular items, uh, feel free to uh, post in there. We'll, uh, we'll uh, reach back out to you and, and give you some of that information. I'll give you a a little bit of time to vote here. So while this is up, um, I've only had two questions come in. Uh, the first question is, can you explain the machining versus modeling features further? Perhaps show where to make that definition in SOLIDWORKS. Well, the definition of a machining feature is predefined in DIM Expert. Uh, really, the difference is very, very simple. Things like a shell that you would define in SOLIDWORKS um, is a type of pocket in the manufacturing world. So we equate essentially a series of features that may make up geometry to a manufacturing feature like a slot or a pocket. And those are all predefined in the software today. Um, question is, can you use ordinate dimensioning using the DIM expert? Um, that answer is no. At this point, we cannot use ordinate dimensioning with the DIM expert. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll here. We'll share that. Looks like we've uh, we've got some information to share with you folks. We'll keep the questions open for another few more minutes. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending today. I want to thank Luis for his presentation and techies. Um, and we look forward to doing more on this topic. Thank you. Don't forget to check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and our blog for more great content by clicking on the links in the description below.